Um, today we are doing a radical mastectomy in a dog that had previously excised mammary cancer. Um, so if we look here on the left chain, we have this previous excision of a low-grade mammary gland carcinoma um, with dirty margins, and then we've got a clean margin down here. And then we've also found another lump on the opposite side down here. Also, we're going to uh, spay the dog at the same time uh, because that's been shown in at least one study to improve survival following mammary gland cancer surgery. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so you'll get a ding on, the on your phone the next time we live stream. So I'm going to start out with the spay. The reason why I'm doing the spay first is, is I don't want to contaminate the abdomen with cancer cells if I happen to get dirty margin again on my uh, uh, repeat surgical excision. And I'm going to be very lazy and do it with ligature. So I'm not very good at doing normal spays. I'm very spoiled. Trying to find midline here. Piyush is the first one on as usual. Piyush sent me a birthday cake from my birthday a couple of days ago. That's a behavior that should be emulated by everybody. In fact, not all birthday cake. I think that I maybe I should just get a cake a month from somebody. Just like a subscription follower cake. Yeah, right yeah. So you guys just have to make a roster, and each person or one person send me a cake each month. If that goes well, we can move to weekly. Piyush has set an excellent example. Um, so that's a good question. Normally in cats we do bilateral strips and in dogs we just do unilateral. Now the difference with this one is that there is a tumor on the opposite side. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to send it off and see if it comes back malignant. If it comes back malignant, we probably are going to recommend doing the other side as well. Now the problem in dogs is that they don't have as much skin in cat as cats. And so in cats you can do both sides at the same time. Whereas in dogs, um, you have to do one side and then the other. I'm very relieved that I was actually able to find the uterus. But I'm still going to be lazy and use my ligature. Might be getting a little light. Grab my ligature, please. Um, Casey. Just retract on that for me, please. Just give me some tension. Not particularly skilled at routine space. Laparoscopic disc space any day of the week. Ligature spays any day of the week. Mm -hmm. Fat dog spay without a ligature, I'm in big trouble.
other side here. Can you push down on the body wall there for me, please? I was dreading have to get, get, having to get the spay hook out because I really <laughs> only barely know how to use those. I'm very impressed with myself with the size of my incision there. Mm. I would like to have done a complete exploratory. Bleeding there. Can I get a hemostat, please? Can I get some 2 PDS, please? Just hold on to that for me, please. And Casey is a visiting vet student, and she's not allowed to laugh at the way I do my space. It's a lot faster on the way that we had to do them on our shelter rotation, so. So there you go. Give us a nice ligature. <laughs> okay, and up and over. Okay, and then release slowly. And then we re grab. Okay, re grab. And right. yep. And release, please. Thank you. And lap sponge, please. All right. So now, when we close the abdomen, I missed the linear, and so I only have to get external rectus fascia. Um, and you should take the uterine body just distal to the cervix. Um, so, and honestly, it doesn't really matter as long as you get the ovaries out, honestly, because you can do just an ovarectomy on dogs. And so I just like to get the majority of the uterus out.
Do you have any thoughts on ovary sparing procedures? Uh, I don't believe in ovary sparing procedures. I don't mind uterus sparing procedures. So the outcome with an ovarectomy, bilateral ovarectomy is the same as with an ovary hysterectomy. However, sparing the ovaries, I think, is you're basically defeating the purpose of doing the spay in the first place. You're still going to have heat behavior. You're still subject or at risk of developing mammary cancers, pyometra, stump pyometra anyway. I heard an interesting discussion on National Public Radio yesterday. A woman who's a journalist for NPR had um, genetic testing for breast cancer because she has a lot of best breast cancer in her family and was relieved to find out she was negative. About a year later, a surgeon called her and said, look, we found another test that we can do genetically for stomach cancer and we went ahead and tested your blood and found out that you have uh, the gene for gastric carcinoma and there's a 40 to 80 percent chance that you're going to get gastric carcinoma and if you get it you've got a virtually you know almost uh guaranteed that you're going to die of it is so the, the consent that needs to be done to well that's the thing and so the and then the question is well the only do, thing you can do to prevent it is um do a, a complete total gastrectomy mm -hmm. and so she went ahead and did it and surprisingly, she said that her quality of life was exactly the same. She had to eat a little bit slower and chew a little bit more, but she could still eat everything that she could eat before. And, um, but she was initially angry that they had tested her without checking. And so she went and um, interviewed the doctor. And he said, look, you know, unfortunately, as doctors, we have to give bad news sometimes. Um, but I thought that I ha was not... I thought I was giving you an opportunity to change the course of history by knowing about this thing and that's why I, you know, that's why we, we told you. And she said that that completely changed her perspective um, about it recognizing that, not that it was a curse, but that it was an opportunity. Um, and so she was grateful and really glad that she did it. But it's a really interesting ethical discussion about genetic testing and... So I guess some people wouldn't want to know and they'd rather just... Yeah, yeah, but with something that has a 40 to 80 percent chance of death, mm. um, and you can... Was there a 40 to 80 percent chance of death or 40 to 80 percent chance of being right? 40 to 80 percent chance that she was going to get gastric carcinoma, yeah. and a 100 percent chance of death virtually, mm. if you have it. Um, So, and then they had some medical ethicists on the show that we're talking about. One was very much for consumer level genetic testing um, that you just, you, you know, anybody can go to the, the pharmacy, get the test kit and then send it off. Um, and then the, uh, the, the other one was very much for genetic testing, but it had to be by prescription, um, just like any other diagnostic test. And... Um, you know, and the concern is that if you have somebody that's potentially uneducated that gets a list of 10 different tumors that they're genetically sub subjected to, some of which they can do something about and some of which they can't, is that, you know, is that ethical? Is that reasonable to give that person that information? So. Uh, Piyush is asking if there's a chance of a stump pyometra by leaving um, a little bit of the uterus behind. And the fact is that once you take out the ovaries, there's virtually no chance of stump pyometra. And that's been shown just on, you know, in studies where they've done ovarectomies. A lot of big blood vessels in here, and that's because of the previous surgery. So there's a lot of... 
inflammatory tissue. And then the other question is, you know, if you got a genetic test back that said either you have a 1% chance of having this cancer or a 5% chance of having this cancer, based on the genetic testing, would you do something about it then? And those are questions that I think that the average person without a lot of information is going to struggle to answer. And you might have somebody who's really risk averse and just goes out, you know, goes around cutting out body parts. This owner mentioned that this dog's skin has always been very thin, and I was skeptical, but it actually is very thin skin. And the reaction that we're getting from the cautery is not that the dog can feel it, um, it's just directly stimulating the musculature. We can't forget to take out that other mm -hmm. tumor. What's that? I did like your response to her antibiotics. Yeah. We just have a big responsibility as vets to be careful with antibiotics because we're creating public health or contributing to a public health disaster. Can you stretch that for me, please? Now, if we were worried about our ability to close this, can you think of anything that we could do to bring more skin in? Aaron? So if we were struggling to, you know, we had too much tension, can you think of anything that we could do to bring more skin to the area, like back here? Um, flap? Yeah, which one? <laughs> um, What's the most common one I do? Flank fold? Yeah. So a flank fold flap would be a consideration here. Do you think we have enough skin? Uh, yeah. I checked.
interesting, in, in human medicine, um, breast cancer surgery is often done by plastic surgeons. Like the actual resection. Sometimes, they, if it's something really big and bad, they'll probably get a surgical oncologist in there to do the resection, and then the plastic surgeon will do the recon. Can I get Carter turned up to 40, please? Yes, please. Yep. I have a question for you guys listening or watching. If you were doing, how much does this dog weigh? So in a 19 kilo dog, to close the abdomen, after a spay, what size suture would you use? Use. So you've got a little, you know, seven centimeter incision. What size suture would you personally use to close the abdominal wall? What did you guys use in the human society? Well, we had all of the cats. <laughs> Sorry, right. I haven't actually done the dogs yet. Um, like two or three oh? Two or three oh, right. Yeah. So my, my two oh was adequate. Yeah. You can see here the blood vessel that's going down the middle, middle here. So it's the caudal superficial epigastric, which is what you'd use if you were using this as an axial pattern flap. Can I get some OPDS, please? The question is, what wide margins from the lumps do you need to take for a mastectomy? Uh, so from the masses themselves, you want to get a couple of centimeters. Um, on the mammary chain, you just basically need to get the, the nipples out and, and majority of the mammary gland tissue. We've got a lymph node here as well, which is good. And that's gonna have, actually the caudal superficial epigastric will be down there. and we'll send all this off for Hista. Can I get some OPDS, please? Thank you. All right, so we've got a little bleeder in here somewhere. All right, can we get some epivacan, please? Sorry.
So somebody commented at our hospital, I would go with OPDS because our hospital uses cheap sutures and so I would want to be able to sleep at night, which is perfectly reasonable. And I was debating between using 2O and O. At least I know that PDS is going to last for a long time. So I'm diluting my mepivacaine. I'm squirting it on topically. And you want to go around and then just inject within the body of the skin. So I'm going to close in two layers. I'm going to try to get like cutaneous trunk eye to try to reduce the amount of tension that we're putting on the skin surface. And this definitely does not need a drain. Um, I am tacking it down to the underlying tissue periodically. I, so the question is, um, what, do, what do I feel about tacking? Um, I, think it's, I think it's a good idea, and while it can be uncomfortable, um, I think that a, de, you know, a serum or a dehiscence or whatever could also be uncomfortable. So I would, I would probably do it. Now this, I do do it. This is um, under a bit of tension here. I may have to do a Z-plasty or something to reduce the tension. Now the other interesting thing about skin is that it's viscoelastic, which means that the tension on the skin or the amount of stretch you get depends on the rate at which you apply the stretch or the tension, which means that if we put some tension on the skin for a little while, you'll, the skin will actually loosen. tension here. Um, I'll probably close it first. Can I 
So let's see where, where is that tension? Can I get some more OPDS, please? To the skin. Yeah. So I've got lots of room down here. This dog should probably, I would imagine, be on a fancy CRI overnight. That long, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, do you want to take that one out with about a centimeter? Of the, the tiny tip of the blade is um, poke through. Poke through yeah. yeah. Can we get um, another blade, please? Can you cut that for me, please? Um, so there's a comma, a comment about undermining um, the skin, and that's certainly something that we could do. I don't love undermining, especially with cancer surgery, because you have potential to release cancer cells further away from your incision, although I feel very confident in this case that we've gotten it all. So you're happy with the, just around the circle? Uh, so about a centimeter around that circle. So you can use the Sharpie, if you'd like, to redraw a margin. It's a very nice drawing. Good circle. Sorry. Were you very good at staying within the lines when you coloured? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, was all right. Do you want to come around this side? Yeah, of course. Just in here would be fine. That's fine. Yeah, just push the table away. You can use cautery. So. You don't have to go all the way down to the body wall.
Это... It bled more than my whole surgery. <laughs> Grab the hemostat, please. Yeah. I'll just really show that. Can you blot that for me, please? Just blot. Thank you. So that's all caudal superficial mm -hmm. epigastric. Mm -hmm. Might make such a good axial pattern flap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll probably have to go back and put the ligature on that. A little bit wider. Not there yet. I'd probably use cut rather than coag. And cut with the edge. Yeah. Just make sure that we got it in here. Yep, we did. I'll have to submit that separately. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, what am I going to do with this? This actually feels like it should come together. Seems like right here is where the tension is. Can I get um, some more? Uh, I'll just use this. Um, can we get some 2 OPDS, please? Go ahead and start closing that guy. Let's grab the nails, please, for Casey. for me. Does that feel like it's under a lot of tension or not too bad? No, not too bad. Some two and nylon, please. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yes. Thank you.
And if you turn your scissors over and have the points down, mm -hmm. it'll be a little bit easier. Easier? Mm-hmm. It's just keeping the pointy ends up away from the middle. Yeah. <laughs> If you're going to use the curve of the scissors, if you're not going to use them to your advantage, at least don't use them to your disadvantage. <laughs> I think just skin. Yep. A couple of packs of two and nylon, please. Uh, we can use, I'll probably keep using this. That's two OPDS, right? We will probably need it. The reason why I'm doing skins instead of an intradromal because this this skin is quite thin. Um, so a question about bandaging. I don't know that I would bandage this. I don't think that an off-site bandage would work. And so I'd probably just leave it open, possibly put a t-shirt on the dog or something, just to keep the incision clean. I'm not a slow suture, but this is taking a long time. <laughs> it's a pretty long incision. In terms of post-op medical management, so on the fentanyl, CRI, or it's here overnight, yeah. um, what will you do when it goes home? Uh, we'll send it home with a fentanyl patch yep. and coating, mm -hmm. uh, coating as needed. Mm -hmm. Um, probably meloxicam and then maybe some gabapentin as well. So GABA, fentanyl patch, codeine if needed. Fent um, Fent fentanyl patch. I put on a fent CRI. Yeah, so fent, fent CRI overnight, fentanyl patch, um, and then codeine and then meloxicam as well. Um, and GABA. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to do the checklist, the, the plan? Yeah. Um, so there's a question about skin staples. Um, I, I just don't like skin staples in animals at all. 
Um, I think that there's such a variability in the thickness of the skin. Skin staples are specifically made for humans with, that have much thicker skin than animals. And so there have been studies that have shown that in some specific conditions like after TPLO surgery in dogs that the risk of infection is significantly higher using skin staples than uh, using sutures. Um, my preference in most cases is intradermals, uh, and then in this case we're using can I get, um, we're using um, cruciates because um, the skin is so thin. But in, again, in general, I like I don't like using skin staples. Aaron, I'm nearly finished with the whole nice. incision. Try not to waste suture. <laughs> hey? Yeah, go ahead. Exercise restriction for two weeks. Exercise restriction. Um, yeah, meloxicam to go home. Um, to the extent for days. Seven. Yes. It's always nerve wracking suturing on live stream <laughs> with Charles watching. And me competing with you. No, I'm almost the reason. I, I beg your pardon? How many mix per kick for the coding? Uh, half mic per kick. I was watching a recent video and Anna called out on stream for a <laughs> short and the and doing what? The, the ends were a bit too long. Oh. What's that? Uh, coding is uh, seven days, but that put a note in there that that's to be used after the fentanyl patch wears off. Uh, nope. Yeah. Uh, seven and fourteen. Intern is fine. Actually, senior intern. Uh, Q four. Uh, nope. Just pain. Pain scales. Normal. So no, no bandage or dressing on the wing? No. Isocyte? Uh, uh, it'd be hard to do the whole thing, but if she, I mean, she might like it, so. Can I get some more to her? Yes, please. Any additional blood work? Uh, no. No additional blood work. Um, yep, and overnight, regardless. Yep. Uh, sorry. Yes, please. Um, she's quite an anxious dog. Can we give that to her supper? Because I don't know what she'll eat for us. Yeah. And she can have any sedation. I'll run to the airport, you run around the block. <laughs>
It's because I've had to cut 50 sutras in the time you cut four. <laughs> Is that one pack? Yeah, one pack. Right. <laughs> if that one that we removed here is turns out to be metastatic as well. Is it likely that's another primary or can it secondary multiple, multiple. Usually it's, it's hard to say when it's within another mammary gland in the other chain, we, I would assume that it's uh, another primary. It's hard to know. It usually doesn't spread from chain to chain, but... The other thing we could do here would be to Velcro an elastic strap across the incision just so that there's less tension on the skin, like from here to here. Yeah, I think it feels fine. Sure there aren't any other questions and then we'll wrap it up so if you haven't already done so please subscribe to our channel make sure you turn on notifications so you get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream um, and we will see you 